My name is John Wolf, and my topic is Seismic Design Considerations for Retaining Structures. To give a little background on this topic, retaining wall design is very common for the structural engineer. Sometimes a geotechnical report will be available that pro provides both the static and dynamic pressures that the retaining wall should be designed to. However, if there is no geotechnical report available, the structural engineer must be able to determine the appropriate static and dynamic loads. The objectives of this presentation are to first of all present methods for determining the seismic forces acting on retaining structures using the pseudo-static approach and secondly to apply the pseudo-static approach to cantilevered or yielding and basement or non-yielding walls. First we will look at a typical cantilevered retaining wall. As the top of the wall flexes, two failure wedges will develop that will mobilize the shear stresses in the soil. The active wedge is developed in the backfill as the wall moves away and the passive wedge is developed at the toe of the wall as the wall moves into the soil. The lateral pressures and resultant forces are typically found using the ranking theory assuming no friction on the wall face. First the ranking active and passive pressure coefficients are determined based on the soil's internal friction angle using the more coulomb approach. These values are then used to determine the active and passive pressure distribution and resultant forces. There is also a friction resistance determined by multiplying the combined weight of the wall and soil mass over the heel and toe by the coefficient of friction with concrete. The vertical forces acting on the cantilever retaining wall include the weight of the soil over the heel and toe of the base the weight of the concrete wall and base, and the resultant bearing force from the soil. Here we can see the horizontal and vertical forces needed to perform a static analysis. Uh, this figure also shows where these forces act. There are three things we must check for uh, for the static stability analysis of the cantilever retaining wall. These include the stability against sliding, the stability against overturning, and bearing pressure failure. For sliding and overturning, the factor of safety should be at least greater than or equal to 1.5 for the static conditions. Now we want to look at determining the seismic lateral forces acting on the cantilevered retaining wall. We will look at three pseudo-static methods for estimating the seismic forces, including the mononabi akabi method, the method by Seed and Whitman, and the method presented by Day. Before we look at the different pseudo-static methods, one thing that is common to all these methods is the coefficients of pseudo-static acceleration. They are determined by dividing the horizontal and vertical acceleration by the acceleration of gravity. The coefficient of vertical acceleration can be taken as zero for analysis. The first method is the mononabi akabi method, which is an extension of the Coulomb theory for active and passive pressures. This method has been around for many years. The mononabi akabi method determines the total thrust, that is the static plus dynamic thrust, acting on the cantilevered retaining wall. The re resultant force acts at a distance of h over 3 above the base. However, the static thrust can be subtracted out of this to accommodate applying the uh, dynamic thrust at a different height. The second method is a method by Seed and Whitman, which is an extension of the mononabi akabi method. This method is applicable to conditions where the wall face is vertical and there is no sloping backfill. It assumes a failure wedge defined by the geometry shown in the figure in the, in the slide. The computed seismic thrust is applied at a height of 0.68 above the base. The third method is a method presented by Day. This method is similar to that of Seed and Whitman except that it assumes a failure wedge determined by the Rankine theory and the seismic thrust is applied at a height of 2 thirds h above the base. This method is very convenient because it can be used in conjunction with a static analysis performed using the Rankine theory. In order to perform a pseudo-static seismic analysis, the maximum acceleration will need to be known for the area where your site is located. 
One means of obtaining the maximum acceleration is from the U.S. Geological Survey's earthquake website in the form of hazard maps. Now we will look at another type of retaining wall commonly designed by the structural engineer, the basement wall. As can be seen in the typical basement wall shown, it is supported at the top and the bottom and thus it cannot move relative to the soil and therefore is termed a non-yielding wall. Since the basement wall does not deflect, active and passive wedges will not develop. Therefore we must use the at rest earth pressures to determine the static load applied to the basement wall. This is found using the at rest coefficient of earth pressure or K sub zero. Concrete basement wall design, when there are no axial loads present, is based on the maximum bending moment caused by the soil's lateral pressure. Now typically a one foot strip of wall is modeled as a simply supported beam for this analysis. In the same manner we used for cantilevered retaining wall design, we want to be able to determine the dynamic load on the retaining wall and add this to the static load to compute the total bending moment. Two pseudo-static methods available for this are the wood method and the method presented by Day. The wood method provides a means of determining the dynamic thrust and the dynamic overturning moment for a non-yielding wall. However, this method requires the use of graphs and also requires knowing, the, knowing what the soil's Poisson's ratio is to determine the dynamic loads. The second method is the method presented by Day. This method involves modifying the dynamic thrust determined for a yielding retaining wall so that it can be applied to a non-yielding wall. This is done by simply multiplying the yielding wall thrust by the ratio of the at rest coefficient of earth pressure to the coefficient of active earth pressure. This thrust is then applied at a distance of two-thirds the wall height above the base. In summary, various methods have been presented to estimate the seismic loads on both cantilevered retaining walls and basement walls using the pseudo-static approach. The pseudo-static method provides a very simple means of determining seismic forces on retaining structures. In conclusion, the structural engineer must consider all forces in the design of any structure. Retaining wall design is obviously no exception. Thank you very much.